Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Fatima Jama and I'm the Assistant Coordinator for the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium Africa. Um, and I'll be moderating the session today. So this webinar is part of an ongoing series of webinars called Inspiring Research in Neuroscience in Africa. Uh, and today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ignatio Mata joining us from the Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute in the US. Um, so before I pass it on to Dr. Mata, I will quickly give a brief introduction. Dr. Mata is currently assistant staff at the Genomic Medicine Institute, part of the Learner Research Institute at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, as well as an assistant professor of molecular medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He has worked in the field of Parkinson's disease genetics for nearly, uh, for nearly 16 years and authored and co-authored over 70 manuscripts on Parkinson's genetic, Parkinson disease genetics. Um, Dr. Mata's lab uses approaches like case control and family studies to identify those genetic risk factors that modify risk or cause the disease. A significant focus of Dr. Mata's research has also been performing genetic studies in non-European populations, especially those with a minority ethnic background, such as Latinos. For this, Dr. Mata created and coordinates the Latin America Research Consortium on the Genetics of PD Large PD, a collaboration of more than 35 institutions in 12 countries in Latin America. Um, and Dr. Matt will be talking more about the consortium today. So um, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Matt, for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, good morning or good evening or uh, afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I, I really want to thank uh, IPDGC Africa for, for inviting me and UCL for inviting me to, you know, to speak to you today about uh, something that is really uh, you know, near to my to my heart, which is the work that we've been doing in Latin America for uh, over 15 years now. Uh, so I'm going to mix a little bit of uh, personal stuff and, and science all, all together just to give you an overview of how this started, uh, some of the things that we've done and, you know, how we're going to move uh, uh, forward from, from now on. So, so I'll just start uh, by introducing myself a little bit. So I'm originally from Spain. I'm a molecular biologist by training. I studied biology and then I got really interested in genetics and specifically the genetics of the brain. Uh, I, I like to, to, to tell people that, you know, uh, the patients of, uh, with, of people with Parkinson's disease are really my, my bosses from, from the beginning. I was lucky to get a, a a grant that was paid uh, entirely by a, a Parkinson support group in my hometown. And that's how I was able to start my research uh, in Parkinson's disease. And you can see some of uh, pictures here. They actually attended my thesis uh, defense. And then I uh, got an award from my university of the best uh, thesis of that uh, year in my department. So they came for the award as well. Uh, so I've been, you know, I, I'm, I feel very lucky that I've been uh, uh, in touch and very close to the, the people that I'm trying to, to help. Uh, and I, I think that really helps motivate uh, uh, me as a scientist, um, you know, to work really hard to try to uh, find, a, a, you know, hopefully a cure for, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to go to the Mayo Clinic, to uh, Matt Ferrer's lab uh, in Jacksonville, where uh, I started working on a, on a gene that is now really well known called LRK2 or LRRK2. Uh, and this is really where, where, the, where the story uh, began. So I was, I was working there, fin almost finishing my, my PhD thesis, and I had the opportunity to travel to Peru uh, to a meeting. So they invited me to talk about LRK2 and how LRK2 you know, could be a very important gene for Parkinson's disease. Uh, this was back in 2006. Uh, this meeting was organized by the Movement Disorder Society of Latin America, which is now a uh, part of the Movement Disorder Society, the Pan American Movement Disorder Society. Um, and uh, th this trip really opened my eyes um, uh, to, to several things. One is the, obviously the need uh, in some of these countries of you know, uh, uh, resources to be able to do more genetic uh, analysis, but also the the huge uh, problem that th there is in, in genetic studies uh, where you know, most of the individuals that are participating in these studies are from European uh, ancestry. So after I gave my talk about LER2, there was several clinicians that approached me and they asked me if there was any uh, articles or if I knew of any data, including uh, Hispanic Latinos or people from Latin America, 
to see if, if LER2 was actually present. Obviously, there's, you know, it was present in Europe, uh, in Latin America, there's a lot of uh, European ancestry. So they, they thought that they probably some of their patients were carrying some of the mutations that I was uh, talking about. Uh, I said that I, you know, I, I didn't think that there was any studies done in Latinos at the time, um, you know, and they said that it would be really interesting to look at, at these populations and see what the frequency of these mutations were. So we, we started, it wasn't called RHPD or anything. We didn't have a big, we didn't have big goals for this. I, the, the idea really started by trying to, to help them uh, identify uh, uh, LER2 carriers. So we started with two sites, one in uh, Lima, Peru, and then another one in Montevideo in Uruguay. And um, they were sending you know, patients whenever they could uh, get DNA from, uh, from some of the Parkinson's patients. And I was just screening them for the most common uh, 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 genetic mutation. So, so this this project that again it didn't really start with big big goals um, has been organically growing uh, for the past uh, you know 15 years uh, to now be the largest uh, cohort of uh, Latino Parkinson's patients um, uh, in the world. Uh, so now we have about 35 uh, different sites in 12 different countries, including. Uh, you know, anywhere from Mexico to southern Argentina, and then now also some uh, some of the Caribbean islands, because as, as you can imagine, the the uh, genetic ancestry of these populations are very different. And I'm actually going to show you this uh, using some genetic data, uh, how how diverse these populations are. But anyway, so all the work that I'm going to present really is thanks to you know all these collaborators that you know through the years have been enrolling recruiting uh, data and samples from uh, their own patients uh, usually driven by you know by wanting to know more but also trying to help out uh, uh, you know understanding better what the genetic makeup or the genetic characterization of their patients uh, are in obviously they have a lot of families uh, that they're following, so having genetic data on these families is very important for for them to to understand, you know, where why they're uh, getting Parkinson's disease and being able to uh, counsel these these families. So obviously, uh, it wasn't easy, and I I don't think I have to speak to this group about the, you know the hardest the hardship of uh, working with um, you know uh, low middle income countries where you know there's a lot of uh, uh, issues usually, you know, with funding and bureaucracy and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there's lack of uh, uh, training. Uh, so, so there's a lot of, a lot of things that we had to uh, fight at the beginning. Uh, an important one was also trust. I think uh, a lot of uh, our collaborators had, uh, had previous experiences that made them not want to uh, collaborate with people outside of, uh, uh, of Latin America. Because uh, you know they've sent samples to other institutes or other researchers and never heard back, uh, which is not a good way to to do this. So I, I think uh, a lot of the you know groundwork that we had to do at the beginning was to to try to you know gain their their trust uh, and and you know show them by you know um, putting a lot of effort and uh, in in trying to make this partnership uh, as equal as as we could. And you know, make sure that they were involved in every single step. So no, that they were not uh, basically machines of uh, of recruiting patients, but they were actually involved in in all the science. Uh, they got all the data back, and and you know, make sure that they gain uh, uh, something as well from from this partnership. So it has to be a you know a biological symbiosis where you know both both individuals uh, um, uh, gain from from the experience. Uh, I, I'm going to show you through the presentation some of the things that we've tried to do to, to do this, and uh, a lot of them involve not only you know trying to get funding for them, but also you know capacity building uh, and a lot of education, not only clinicians but also patients and and, uh, and uh, the population in general in some of these in some of these countries. So just to give you an overview of, of what we are right now. Uh, you can see here the number. So we have about 4,000 individuals. About half of them are uh, patients, and the other one, the, the other half are uh, healthy controls. Uh, these samples were recruited uh, uh, up to 2016, uh, from 2009 to 2016, uh, with uh, a grant from the Parkinson's Foundation, $150,000 uh, grant, uh, 
uh, where most of the money actually went down to uh, to our research to our collaborators uh, to be able to help with uh, recruitment. Um, it became very obvious uh, from the get go that the way people collect data is very different. So we decided to do a, you know to standardize the data collection by uh, putting together a questionnaire. Um, and you know we wanted to get some clinical data, but we were also interested in pesticides and some other factors that might be important for, for the disease uh, that could be different between populations. So we this questionnaire is currently about, I think 13, 14 pages. We've added a few uh, um, in the last uh, few months with uh, some non-water uh, symptoms that we weren't including and some other uh, uh, questions, but it basically includes, you know, about two or three pages of clinical data and then a lot of environmental exposure. And this, this um, questionnaire can be either self-administered by the, by the patient. And now with COVID, actually, we're trying to do a lot of that. So uh, mail it to patients so they can uh, pre-fill it uh, before they go to the clinic, or it can be done also by a research coordinator by phone, for example. Uh, it used to be in paper, and now that we're at the Cleveland Clinic, we we'll have access to RedCap. So we've done is now everything is digital, and all our collaborators have uh, their own accounts in our RedCap, so they can put uh, data in there, and we can uh, do quality control live uh, as they're entering the data to make sure that you know everything is filled correctly. Um, uh, obviously, we have uh, two different languages that are spoken uh, in Latin America, so we translated both. Uh, all the questionnaires to uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, since three, four years ago, we started getting really interested in non-motor symptoms. So we added uh, the MOCA, which is a cognitive function uh, uh, um, a test that can be done in about 20 minutes. So we try to do that for everybody. Um, so we were really lucky a couple of years ago that uh, um, we got a grant from the Michael G. Fox Foundation to be able to recruit more samples um, so as you can see here, our goal is to do about 5,000 in the next two years, 5,000 extra, uh, to get a total of about 10,000, hopefully, uh, uh, by the end of 2021. Although with COVID, uh, recruitment has been uh, slow, so it might take us a little bit longer, um, but we've added a few new sites, so we're, we're hopeful that we can uh, get to these numbers. Um, so as, as I mentioned, one of the first things that we wanted to, to see, and, and I think this happens as well with uh, populations in Africa. You know, people here in the U.S., for example, they think about Latinos as a one single group. Uh, I think, again, people think about people in Africa as well as one single group, but we wanted really to, to, to see how diverse these populations are. So since we didn't have any, any funding to do, you know, big genotyping projects, we uh, partnered together with some researchers at the University of Washington who were population geneticists geneticist and they help us develop a 29 ancestry informer marker so 29 genetic markers that can help separate at least the four big groups so the african component amerindian asian and european you can see here uh, using the hap map samples that it work they work really well yes with 29 snips and we thought that this would be something that you know it can be done by either tacman or multiplex uh, real-time pcr and then uh, we did this for uh, you know, a random set of some individuals in different countries. Uh, you can see here as a, for a reference, how the Mexicans from the HAP map look like. And you can see here, so each, each of these columns is an individual and then the color means each of the four big groups. So you can see, for example, uh, this individual right here has about 60% of Amerindian, which is the yellow. Then he has about probably 30% or more of the green, which is the European, and then you know we all carry a little bit of African in them, on, on us, right? So, so this is the the Mexicans. Then we can see here some of the our patients from or a healthy control. Well, it was uh, a random selection. You can see here uh, people from Argentina are mostly European, as you would expect based on on history. Uh, these are Peruvians, uh, Amerindian Peruvians that uh, I'll explain uh, at the end of my talk, where are they coming from? But you can see that they're almost 90, uh, over 90% Amerindian. These are the regular uh, Peruvians from Lima. Uh, and you can see that from all the cohorts that we uh, have, they're the most Amerindian uh, of all, but they still have uh, you know, some European and some African in them. Then you are is Uruguay, which are also quite European. Uh, the Colombians are, and these are from a specific region in Colombia where it looks like there's a lot more European ancestry than 
uh, we thought. And then the Brazilians, which are really together with the Colombians, the two cohorts where the, there's a significant amount of African ancestry. All the other ones have very little uh, African ancestry. So as I said, we started just looking at some of these individuals just for, for layer two uh, mutations. Um, and obviously G2019S is the most uh, widely known, is almost present, present in uh, all populations in the, in the world uh, with very different frequencies. When we did our study in Latin America, we also saw that there was a big difference uh, and you know the frequency ranges from uh, almost 5% in Uruguay to uh, very low. Actually, this number is now 0.1%. So we have only one individual in Peru that has this G2 and NTNS out of almost 700 that we have screened. So, so the frequency is very low. And we published a couple of years ago that it, there's a very nice correlation between how much European ancestry there is in, in these countries. Uh, you know, with the percentage of, of, of carriers that you find. So basically there's a, there's a nice association between how much European ancestry they have and, uh, and uh, you know, what is the frequency of the, or how frequently we find these uh, mutations in this gene. And you can see here that Peru, which has the lowest European has very low frequency. And then it goes up as the uh, ancestry grows up. And if you, bundle all the LER2 uh, carriers is even more, uh, um, uh, you know, it's even more um, associated with a, a p-value of 0.02. Uh, so it, it is, it's very obvious that, you know, that they're very heterogeneous. These populations are very diverse, uh, but, you know, it really plays a, a role, at least for this gene, on how much European ancestry you have. And, uh, and th this makes sense because as we know, most, most samples or most patients that are carrying mutation, the g 2 s mutation, uh, come from uh, one single uh, ancestor that came, you know, that, uh, that is thought to be, you know, to arose uh, somewhere in the Middle East, about 250 BC. This is a study that we did when I was in uh, um, Seattle about uh, g 2 s haplotypes. And the, the idea is that we, we think probably uh, this mutation uh, went to South America with the uh, you know, European uh, conquistadors. And in fact, all the patients that we have uh, in, in Latin America that have this g 19 s have the European haplotype. There are two other haplotypes that are uh, much, more, much more restricted. One is in the UK and then there's another one in Japan. But most of the patients all across the world have this same uh, uh, haplotype. So th this all makes sense. And, and, and yes, it's a, yes, it's a, a food for thought here. Th this really shows us how important is uh, local ancestry. So the, the, the ancestry at a local level, no, somebody said, oh, I'm 50% European uh, or I'm, you know, 100 or 90% African. But here we're going in the, in the case of this gene, which is in, uh, you know, in chromosome 12, the importance here is that you can be in, a, you can be a Latino with 90% Amerindian, but if any of that 10% that you have European uh, actually contains that region in chromosome 12 where LER2 is, your risk or, or your, you know, the likelihood that you can carry g 2 s now becomes the same frequency of the, if you were fully European because because that that chunk came from a European ancestry. So so it really speaks out of you know the important here uh, for especially for disease risk and in monogenic or or in diseases where there's only a few genes. It really comes to where that gene came from, what ancestry. You can be all the other genes could be a different ancestry, but if that gene specifically came from a European or it came from Africa, and then now, in, in terms of risk, you are this, you have the same risk of somebody that is fully European or some, or fully African, and this obviously is in a simple, is very simple without considering that there could be gene gene interactions and other things, right? But but yes, in, yes, yes to uh, acknowledge the fact that local ancestry is very very important. Uh, another study that we uh, ran also a few years ago was trying to study GBA, uh, which is the gene that. Uh, uh, encodes for uh, uh, the glucose uh in a recessive manner. It causes uh, Gaucher disease, uh, but it's been known for a while that uh, people that have a hetero heterozygous mutations in this gene have an increased risk for uh, PD. And depending on the population, it could be anywhere from six to 14-fold 
uh, increase in risk. And so we wanted to know if this gene was also playing an important role in on risk in Latin America. And, and in fact, uh, we, we did show that it, it is important the frequency um, in Peru, for example, is very similar to what we see in the US. It's almost 5% uh, of patients will have a, a, a pathogenic variant in, in GBA. Uh, the distribution is quite different though. And we can see here that L44P, which is usually about 50% in the US, uh, it was more than 60% uh, in, in Peruvian patients. And then the, in Peruvian patients, they had some mutations that came from Spain that are not present in the, in the US. But I think the most interesting part of, of this here was uh, in Colombia, we found that the frequency is actually doubled. Uh, so almost 10% of patients in, in Colombia have uh, a GBA pathogenic variant. And this increase is not, is not due overall to an increased number of mutations, but it's really caused by this uh, yellow variant, uh, which is a, a specific variant in Colombia. It's only been found in Gaucha patients in Colombia. And uh, about 50% of the carriers carry this uh, one uh, variant. Um, and again, we haven't seen it in any other country, even in Latin America. So it seems to be very population specific. So again, it speaks up about, it's not only important to include Latinos in genetic uh, studies, but you know, every population has something that you can learn from. And, and I have the feeling that, you know, it's gonna be the same in, in, in Africa where, you know, we need studies in all countries to be, make sure that the diversity is big enough that we can find some of these uh, differences. And I, I believe that the same will be applicable um, in, in your studies. So I, I think, uh, as I said, most of this work was done with the, as a, a small uh, grant from the Parkinson's Foundation. Uh, and then in 2016, we were uh, lucky to be awarded with one of the first uh, Stanley Fan Junior Faculty Awards that really was a game changer for us. This allowed us to do uh, a genome uh, wide uh, genotyping in some of our samples. It was still a uh, small uh, grant in terms of, you know, big NIH or other grants. So it only allows to genotype about um, uh, 1,500 of our individuals, but obviously there's a lot of things that you can do with so much uh, data. So we were able to do the first GWAS, which I'll present now. Uh, it's, it's not super, you know, it's kind of underpowered uh, in terms of numbers, but there's uh, some interesting things in there. Uh, and also allow us to um, do some families that we have been studying uh, using a next next-gen sequencing uh, panel uh, to try to see if we can find families uh, with either novel mutations in known genes or even more interestingly that are negative uh, for mutations in known genes and see if we can, that would allow us to identify new genes associated to Parkinson's disease. So, so this was uh, carried between 2016 and 2019. Um, we use the multi-ethnic global, uh, global uh, array from Illumina, which uh, really allow us to uh, um, get a lot of data from variants that are non-European. Uh, as you see here, we genotype about 1,536 uh, uh, individuals and about we got about 1.8 million variants. And after QC, we, uh, we were short for 1,500 individuals and we got about 1.3 uh, million variants. And that's before imputation. Then after imputation, there were uh, uh, about 40 million uh, variants that we got with a very good genotyping rate. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that we did was to do a, a PCA or a principal component analysis to do basically the same thing that we had done with those 29 ancestry informer markers that I show you, but now with you know tens of thousands of, of markers. And you can see that, again, our cohort is very, very diverse. This is something that you will see if you run a, a PCA on, on, in the US with samples from uh, Latinos. Um, uh, here you can see in black the Europeans for reference, then you have the Amerindians here in purple. So you can see here that you can kind of separate the countries. So here you have in pink, uh, the samples that came from Peru, you have in yellow mustard color here, the ones from Colombia, you have the blue ones here in Brazil, but they're very spread. So even within each country, the, you know, the diversity is very high. Uh, and obviously, you know, between countries is very, very different. Um, um, so, so this was interesting on its own, but again, nothing new of what we knew already with the 29 uh, um, uh, ancestry informer markers that we had used. Uh, but we, we ran a, a standard uh, GWAS analysis and uh, we were happy to see the sinuclein, which is the top hit for 
every single GWA that have been run in, in different populations so in Europe, now in Asia, and, and also in Latin America. So even with only 1,500 individuals, we can see that cynuclein is uh, significant after uh, correction for multiple testing. And then we found a new head. Uh, it is almost significant, depending, depending how you analyze it. Sometimes it's over, sometimes it's uh, uh, under in this, uh, close to this NROS gene in chromosome three. And it doesn't overlap with any other uh, uh, locus that has been associated to um, uh, European uh, or Asian individuals. Um, uh, you can see here that in, in for cynuclein, some of the SNPs were, you know, your usual suspects in other populations. Some of them were uh, uh, different, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, the, there was about uh, over 100 uh, variants in cynuclein that were uh, significant uh, uh, after multiple testing. And then we used the 23andMe cohort to try to replicate our results, both for cynuclein and for the NROS. Uh, they use about uh, 1,200 Hispanic Latinos, self-reported uh, uh, patients, and then about almost uh, 500,000 uh, healthy controls. And they were able to replicate our uh, uh, results in synuclein. Uh, however, they were not uh, able to replicate things uh, in chromosome 3. Uh, I, I have to say that this, this uh, locus is mostly um, uh, driven by our Peruvian samples, which are, as I said, the most Amerindian. And uh, there's a big difference between the amount of Amerindian that the Latino uh, cohort has compared to ours. I, I think theirs is about 14% on average, and ours were almost 50% on average. Uh, so I think that might be that might be the problem. But uh, un, until we get a, a larger cohort of Amerindian samples um, uh, to be able to replicate, we won't know for sure if this is just an artifact or if it's real. Um, and this work was done at the University of Maryland by our uh, collaborators, Doug. Uh, and, and Tim. The other thing that we also wanted to know is that from all the variants that were identified by Mike Knowles uh, at all in 2019, how many of those were significant and also to see if the effect was uh, going in the same direction. And, and in fact, for uh, we were able to uh, replicate about 83 of them and 80% of those uh, uh, were reported in direct uh, of effect. And two of them, uh, Sinuclein was one of them, and then the the variant in the uh, CRHR1, um, those two were the only ones that were significant uh, after uh, uh, multiple testing, in this case, uh, 80, 83 variants um, that we corrected for. But so, so this really suggests that there is uh, a substantial overlap, we think, uh, in the genetic architecture of both uh, European and uh, Latino cohorts. But, as I said, one thing that we were really excited about uh, to be able to do with our samples uh, was to uh, use local ancestry. So basically get to the really the nitty gritty uh, of, of the genetic data, not looking at overall uh, ancestry, but looking at haplotypes that came from different populations. And you can, you can there's a statistical uh, ways to do this. Um, uh, they're called admixture mapping. And what you can do is you can break up all those haplotypes in different ancestries. Uh, you obviously you need to have good reference samples uh, to be able to do this, uh, but then you can run a, 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 a association study basically uh, that looks almost like a linkage disequilibrium uh, or a linkage analysis with those haplotypes and look at uh, frequencies. And because you do less comparisons, you don't do all the variants, you only do a few hundred uh, thousand comparisons, then you will have more power uh, to be able to detect. Uh, associations, but then you have to dig in those uh, in those big haplotypes to see what the what the genes are. And we did this with our data, and this was work done uh, at University of Washington by uh, um, by uh, two of our collaborators, uh, Andrea and Tim Thornton. Uh, and we we identify uh, one uh, 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 locus here that came from or is associated to African ancestry. Uh, and then three that are associated to uh, Amerindian ancestry that seem to that they could be uh, uh, significant and important. And again, they don't really overlap with any of the peaks that we see um, in uh, in the studies from uh, European. Um, so so this this is again something that needs to be uh, replicated. But I think it it is interesting that you know using this technique we can identify maybe new areas that might be more population specific. Um, one thing that worries us overall is the, you know, the fact that 
uh, we are using all this European data to try to uh, come up with polygenic risk scores that might help predict who is in a high risk for Parkinson's disease or for other diseases, really. Uh, and the truth is that we, we know for a fact that these polygenic risk scores based on European data might not work really well for other populations. So that you can't really translate that into other populations. We know that African uh, uh, individuals are probably the more uh, the most affected by, by this with a really drop in uh, uh, accurately uh, accurate, uh, uh, for you know for these polygenic risk scores. But uh, Amerindian, uh, there's also a drop. Uh, um, so if we wanted to see if the polygenic risk score based on European data, how well it would predict our cases and controls. Um, in our cohort, and we were really surprised that actually worked better uh, uh, than than uh, in Europeans. And so, so this made us uh, go more in depth to try to study how was this possible. And it was mostly in the Peruvian cohort uh, of all, which again it was it was not it was completely the opposite of what we would have expected. Um, and the reason behind it is this this synuclein uh, SNP, this synuclein the SNPs, uh, which is a very well-known uh, uh, risk SNP in synuclein, explains about 73% of the variance uh, of the polygenic risk score. And it, is, it happens that the G allele, which is the risk allele, is more frequent in, uh, in uh, some uh, areas in Asia and uh, in Latin America than in uh, other uh, regions of the world. And not only that, but a haplotype study showed that the, there's two prevalent uh, 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 G haplotypes. One uh, that is uh, the most common in European uh, um, uh, samples, you can see it here um, in, in orange, uh, versus the red uh, haplotype, which is more common in Amerindians and Asians, both South Asians and East, East Asians. Uh, we, don't, we don't know at this point what that means, uh, but we know that again, this this variant is more frequent. It seems to be more frequent in Amerindians, and it seems to be also in a different haplotype. Um, so this is something that obviously we're looking uh, at and see if we can uh, make some you know some sense of it. But I think again, it it is is by studying other populations is helping us define maybe what areas of synuclein might be more important than others. Um, you know, for functional studies, for example. Something else that you can also do with this big uh, genome-wide genotyping arrays is that you can start looking for uh, CMB, so copy number variants, uh, so areas of the genome where there could be, uh, you know, duplications or deletions um, uh, of certain regions. And we we did this um, in our cohort, and we didn't really find any uh, association between an overrepresentation of copy number variants in, in general uh, and risk for Parkinson's disease. However, we did see uh, an association with uh, CMBs that are located in known PD genes. And uh, this was mostly driven by uh, mutations in Parkin or Park 2 and synuclein. Uh, you can see here that we have quite a few uh, patients um, uh, that had either duplications of uh, uh, synuclein or they had duplications or deletions uh, in the Parkin gene. Uh, this was uh, worked on in my lab by uh, IREM and then in collaboration with a couple of uh, and people here at uh, the Cleveland Clinic that are experts really on, on CMB analysis. And we also did a survival uh, curve to show that uh, it, it, the risk is also associated to the, to the age of uh, onset. Um, uh, so so more, more CMB is, you know, the earlier uh, the age of onset is. Um, so th this is really what we have done with the case control studies. But uh, as I mentioned, we're really interested in, in the in the familial form, so Parkinson's disease as well. Uh, so being able to uh, um, run this next gene sequencing panel uh, that we had designed at the University of Washington allow us to run some of our multiplex uh, families, so families where there's at least two, if not more affected. You can see here actually that a lot of our families have more than three or four, uh, including one that has six affected here. Um, and we, we ran the panel, we found that uh, only one third of, uh, of, the, of the families actually had a mutation in the known gene. About, and about half of those mutations were actually novel mutations in the known gene, which uh, is interesting on its own. But they, this gives us a, a nice list of families where it looks like genetics is playing a, an important role, where 
the no mutation in the known gene uh, uh, was found. So, so these are really good candidates to try to find new genes. And now in collaboration with GP2 and also uh, an R1 that we just got, we're gonna start doing some whole genome sequencing and see if we can uh, find the genetic cause uh, for these families. Um, and, uh, and this was done with a grant with the Parkinson's Foundation, but the APDA also funded us to be able to do this on a much broader level, uh, getting people, anybody that had a family history. And the idea behind this was to try to identify if there was a difference uh, between populations on how many um, individuals had mutations in known genes from each of those countries. And um, this is a, a big table, but I, I want you to focus on, especially on this table over here, uh, where we had the percentage of, of uh, uh, carriers in each of the countries that we analyzed. And you can see here that um, there, there are two countries, uh, Honduras and Peru, which has Peru has only 11% and Honduras only 22% of the individuals that we screened had a, a, a variant that could be potentially pathogenic in one of these known, known genes. Um, and this, this, if you compare with some of the other countries where there's more European ancestry, you know, some of them reach uh, 40 or 50 percent. Uh, uh, so about half of them have a mutation or a, at least a variant that could be pathogenic in one of these genes. So again, it's telling us that those populations that have less European, uh, if you have a panel that is based on the known genes that we know from European uh, uh, individuals, you might miss a lot of mutations. So hopefully we'll be able to find some of this new genes that might be causing Parkinson's in some of these uh, populations. So, so this is just a summary for the, for the science part, some of the things that we've uh, done. So basically, you know, cynuclein is also important in, in Latinos. Uh, we have nominated some uh, new loci that we are, you know, hopefully we can replicate in other uh, cohorts when, when we uh, recruit more individuals. Uh, CMVs and PD genes are uh, also important, which is something that we already knew with uh, with parking. And then again, I think there there is a uh, an opportunity here to study some families that were negative for the panel to see if we can find new genes for uh, for Parkinson's disease. But now I want to I want to finish on a on a strong uh, uh, note to try to 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 try to tell you that. You know, these consortia are really more than just the science, are more than just recruiting the patients. Um, and so one of the things that we've been, do uh, we've been doing is collaborating with local uh, uh, projects. This is the Peruvian Genome Project that uh, started. Uh, so Henry Gio um, started a, a few years back. He wanted to uh, sequence uh, about 100 individuals from 10 different types in, in Peru to try to, um, you know, uh, put, put uh, publicly uh, this data for, for the Peruvian uh, uh, genome, for the Amerindian Peruvian genome. So we collaborate with, with, with him a lot, and we've actually been able to use some of his data to be able to do, for example, the local ancestry uh, using this as a reference samples for our, uh, for our uh, local ancestry and also for imputation. And this is a cohort that we've been working for a few years uh, in Puno. I show you that there were almost 90%, if no more, uh, Amerindian. So this is a, a very interesting um, a tribe uh, uh, that lives outside of uh, Puno near Lake Titicaca. So it is not only interesting because of the Amerindian, but also they live in really high altitude. And we've seen some really interesting findings in, in the genetics, mostly caused by adaptation to living in this really uh, uh, harsh uh, environment. Uh, we're, we're also trying to see what the prevalence of Parkinson's disease is in some of these uh, communities, because that's one question that I get every time I post a, uh, a grant or I give a talk there, people are like, well, is, is there more Parkinson's in Latin America? Do we know? And the truth is that there's not a lot of epidemiological studies that have been known in Latin America. So we don't really know if there are more or less Parkinson's than in other areas. So uh, uh, with funding from the Pogar team uh, at the NIH, we've, we've been running a door-to-door -door, uh, study in a couple of communities uh, in Peru, uh, with our colleagues in, in Peru, try to uh, find, you know, what the prevalence is. Uh, and this has been a really fun project to collaborate with. Um, but a, a, a big, um, I think a big interest of ours is really the mentoring, the building uh, capacity uh, locally. So one of the things that we do is that we, we try to bring uh, uh, 
clinicians, researchers, whoever wants to come. Sometimes there's a lab technician that wants to really learn how to extract DNA and manage a database or a biobank or something. You know, they come for a few, you know, anywhere from a few weeks to a few months uh, with us. Um, and we train them and then they go back to their countries to apply what they've learned. Uh, uh, Mario was one of our first uh, fellows that visited us when uh, we were in Seattle. Uh, he's now the director of the neurogenetics uh, uh, department at one of the largest, uh, well, the reference center really for uh, uh, neurological disorders in Peru. Uh, so he's done really, really well. He was also a Fogarty fellow himself. Uh, and then uh, you can see here Miguel as well, who now works with, with us here in Cleveland. So he's a, a line manager and he has spent a few uh, months with us in Seattle learning um, uh, how to do a lot of the lab work that um, he's now doing. Uh, but we understand that sometimes it's hard to find funding to bring individuals here. Uh, and also, you know, you can only bring so many uh, every year. So some of the things that we've been also doing is trying to uh, do uh, courses uh, locally. So uh, we have bioinformatics is a big need uh, right now, uh, especially because all the data that we're generating, it goes back to the researchers. So we want to make sure that they can use the data to publish, to do uh, uh, their own studies. So, so this is something that we've been really working on. This is uh, uh, the first uh, bioinformatics course that we did back in 2014. Uh, in Peru, we have more than 40 people attended. It was a, a three-day, uh, both theory and also, uh, uh, you know, practical um, analysis. And we included anything from population genetics to GWAS analysis, uh, uh, whole exome, whole genome uh, pipelines, and all, all those sort of th sorts of things. And before COVID hit, uh, I was lucky enough to bring a few people here from the clinic and a few people that you might know, like uh, Sarah, and Cornelius from uh, from uh, the NIH uh, to give a, a, a refresher of, of this uh, bioinformatics course where we included, you know, Mendelian randomization and some other uh, novel uh, techniques that people really found uh, uh, really interesting. So this is something that we were planning to go in Colombia net last year also to redo this because now a lot of different institutions are asking us to, to do this for for them uh, and uh, now through GP2, we're creating a lot of these things uh, as a virtual tools that people can watch like videos and stuff. But sometimes I feel like it's not it's not the same as just being in person there and be able to answer questions and stuff. So it, it's been really uh, fun that way. And what are we doing to move this forward? Uh, now there's a big interest for, for diversity. Uh, so we've been really lucky again to uh, collaborate with um, uh, several organizations. The Michael J. Fox Foundation has been extremely uh, helpful with us, giving us uh, money to, again, increase our recruitment uh, together with the money that they're giving to IPDGC Africa, uh, the study in India, and also studies in South Asia to be able to do uh, more genetic testing and more uh, genetic um, uh, uh, studies in underrepresented populations. Uh, last year, we also got an hour one, so this is going to allow us to genotype all the samples that we're uh, recruiting now and also do some whole genome sequencing in some of the, these families that I was telling you about for, that they're negative uh, for the panel. And hopefully, we'll also be able to not only uh, validate some of the findings that we had in the first GWAS, but also find more things, uh, combine this with all the populations to do trans-ethnic uh, analysis and also really look at polygenic risk scores that are specific to Latinos and see if we can improve uh, um, how well these polygenic risk scores uh, based on European data work. Uh, so this is something that, this is work that we, we will be doing for the next five years. Uh, we're also working uh, closely with, uh, with GP2 uh, to, to, to have this global idea to be able to combine this data uh, put it out there for the public to to analyze and you know really get the most out of this data. Uh, and this has been an incredible partnership that has allowed us to uh, you know collaborate with many of you and many other people across the globe. I'm I'm lucky uh, to lead the underrepresented uh, populations working group. So again, it's is mostly uh, um, uh, including people that work with this non-European uh, populations and try to join forces to be able to do you know, the best we can. Uh, something that GP2 has uh, allowed and is allowing is to, to, you know, to create this environment where we can do more open science and also uh, 
uh, individuals for low and middle income countries have access to this Terra platform on the cloud. They have time, paid time by GP2 that they can use to, to do their analysis. So this is really, you know, uh, balancing out really the necessities that some of these countries have to be able to, you know, get them to also be doing good uh, science, right? And be able to take advantage of all this data that we're generating. Because again, the idea is not for us to do all the analysis, but the, the idea is for local researchers to be able to do their own analysis, come up with their own hypothesis and, you know, be able to test it in an environment where it's not gonna, you know, drain their bank account. Uh, so I think GP2 is really doing an awesome job of being able to help uh, with this. Here in the US, I'm uh, collaborating with the Parkinson's Foundation to try to bring a uh, PD generation, which is a, a, a project where they're doing uh, free genetic testing for patients with Parkinson's disease, bring this to the Hispanic community. So I'm, I'm leading the Hispanic Parkinson's Advisory Council or HPAC uh, to be able to develop the protocols to be able to do this all in Spanish and really do a, a well job and outreaching to these communities to make sure that they participate in genetic testing. Um, and something that we're really excited about is that we're, we're in Peru, uh, which really has been, as you saw during my talk, has been the, you know, one of the first sites where we started collaborating with has been instrumental, uh, you know, genetically, they're very interesting um, individuals, the researchers are really passionate about the patients, so we're, with funding from the Michael J. Fox, we're really building uh, a state-of-the-art biobank that is going to be, you know, used from from years to come uh, to be able to do their job much more efficiently and, and basically uh, better. And this is something that uh, construction is actually starting uh, at the end of this month already. Uh, so we're very excited to bring up, you know, updates on the next on the next meetings. And <clears throat> one of the things that I'm very passionate about as well is, you know, wellness and equity and, and through the PD Avengers, and I, I recommend if you don't know anything about them to go to the website and see what you know what they're trying to do. Uh, but but this is this is something that worries me, and I think I know a lot of people in Africa also worries them. And it's the fact that you know it's great to participate in in research and all uh, uh, all this stuff. But you know, and this is this is the this is the example that I always bring to mind to people to understand how important uh, you know wellness and uh, equity is. Is that you know. There, there will be findings for sure that will come out with being able to study these populations. Uh, some of them might even, you know, be used to develop new treatments and, and whatnot. You know, we can we can follow the example of what happened with, with Huntington's where now the patients that really help uh, identify the gene that causes Huntington's, they cannot afford the therapies that are coming out. So we need to make sure and this is something that we need to keep in mind that we need to make sure that whatever comes from this, it needs to go to those individuals in need, regardless of what they are. And I, again, this is something that worries me in Latin America. I know people in Africa are also worried because even just uh, uh, access to Levelopa, which is the minimal thing that you would think, is already hard. So I can imagine that any new therapies that are being developed or that will be developed uh, with all this knowledge that we're generating uh, might not reach there, and, and that's not fair. And, and we need to make sure that from the beginning we keep this in our minds. And we make, uh, uh, you know, we make sure that we uh, we take care of this, uh, and we don't get to the point where these these treatments don't don't get there. And yes, to finish, I want to do a really cheap uh, 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 talk about uh, the uh, World Parkinson's Coalition, uh, the World Parkinson's Congress, which is happening in Barcelona in 2022. I'm the scientific ambassador. And, uh, and uh, I was I was mentioning to uh, to to your colleagues before that it, it, I want I want to see representation of you know uh, individuals that are working with you know people in Latin America and Africa and Asia. Uh, so uh, although the meeting hopefully it will be in person in Barcelona in 2022, there's already a virtual meeting in 2021. Uh, there's going to be uh, grants for people that live in low middle income countries to participate in this. Uh, it looks like the meeting in Barcelona, even if it's in person, there will be parts that will be also uh, 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 virtually. So you, you'll be able to access and you can get grants to get the registration paid for. Uh, and it's a really good opportunity to showcase uh, all the work. And the nice thing about this meeting is that it also includes patients, uh, um, uh, clinicians, 
uh, and researchers all in one room uh, talking about the needs. So I, I, I highly encourage you to also uh, uh, tell the patients' associations to send things uh, to the meeting and present what are the needs, what are the barriers in, in some of the, the communities that you work with uh, to, to showcase this, because it, there's a lot of people that really pay attention to what happens in this meeting, and I want to make sure that it's well represented. So with that, I'll just finish to, to saying thank you to many, many people. Uh, as I said, this would not be able to be possible uh, without great collaborators uh, all across uh, Latin America and now also in the US and uh, Europe and other places. So I I'll, now I'll take some, some questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Mata. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, and I was really inspired hearing the journey of uh, Large PD, the consortium, and um, the major race, the research outputs um, from it. Um, if anyone has any questions, please leave them in the Q&A section. So we have one question from Dr. Abdin Al Badri, which is, what are the chemicals that increase the incidence of Parkinson's disease? So pesticides is probably the, the most well known, and this is something that we're really interested in exploring in Latin America because uh, the use of pesticides in some countries where there's a, a big uh, uh, production of, uh, for example, banana, pineapple, some, some vegetables that are widely consumed uh, all across the globe um, is uncontrolled. There's not really any control whatsoever, not only in the amounts that they can put in there, but also which uh, pesticides they can use. Uh, we know that, for example, in Brazil, about 50% of the pesticides that are being used are banned in, in a lot of the other countries. Um, so we really want to explore this. But yeah, and there, there's a lot of studies that suggest that especially pesticides have a big uh, impact. Uh, also heavy metals. Uh, and obviously there's all other things that are not toxic, but, uh, toxics, but uh, for example, um, uh, head trauma and some of those things are very important as well. And now people are also suggesting uh, the microbiome could be also very important, which again, it could be very different between populations, exposure to different uh, uh, viruses and things like that in different countries could also be playing a role. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question of my own, um, which is, um, and you touched on it towards the end, especially, um, but what exactly is the benefit of studying underrepresented populations? Um, and what are the ad additional information that this research can provide? Right. So obviously the, the, the biggest thing is for the populations themselves, right? To be able to understand what the genetic makeup is. And if you want to do genetic counseling, uh, you need to know what genes are more prevalent. So you can test for those first. Uh, if you, uh, you know, we, we can think that, uh, you know, medicine is going to a precision medicine uh, uh, era, I think, where, you know, genetic data is going to be used for many things, not only to predict risk, but also maybe to select what is the best treatment for each patient? And this is being done already in cancer, for example. And we can think that this will be also available for other uh, diseases, including neurological diseases. So unless we have good data for these populations, we won't be able to do that accurately in, in this population. So I, I think having that data will help, uh, you know, again, these communities. But overall, I think it can really help, again, define, for example, what regions of synuclein are important. I think. Uh, combining this uh, genetic data from different populations can also identify new uh, loci that we might not have identified otherwise. So I think it really has uh, 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 benefits for, for the overall uh, you know, disease community, but also for the local communities that we're working with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mata. Um, another question, um, reflecting on your career journey, um, for any junior researchers listening, um, what would be the best advice that you would give them? That's a, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, I, I think I think the best thing that I can tell you is to follow your your passion. Uh, you know, from the beginning, this is this has been something that uh, uh, fulfills me. Uh, uh, you know, working with these uh, researchers, and I I can see that we're making a big impact on, and uh, again, not only in the knowledge, but also in the uh, and the amount of research that is coming out from some of these groups, the amount of funding that we've been able to secure because of all the things that we're doing. Uh, and to me, I mean, that, it, it's incredible. Every time I travel there, I see, you know, better and better scientists uh, and again, better science coming out. Uh, 
so uh, yeah I, I would say to to find something that you're really passionate about and 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 stick with it because I, I, at several points in my career i was uh given the choice of going in a different route uh you know so i i'm not competing with my former mentors and, and things like that uh and it, it's been always really hard for me to drop this uh, and as i said i I started on this because patients pay for me to be able to do research. So I, I feel like I would be, uh, 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 you know, do them so, something bad to them if I now I said, oh, now I want to do genetics in cancer or something else. So I, yeah, so it really keeps me motivated. So yeah, that's really amazing. Um, another question: um, Where do you see research in Parkinson's genetics heading? What are you most excited about? Excited about? I think uh, to me, uh, GP2 is the most exciting thing. Having uh, uh, geneticists from, uh, and researchers from all across the globe collaborating in a, in a common platform uh, and being able to you know, analyze data and, and come up with new uh, uh, theories that we wanna test, that to me, that's the most exciting part. Uh, obviously, I, I also wanna use this information to translate uh, to the clinic so I'm always looking for ways that we can use this genetic testing or, or this genetic information to be able to help. Uh, so I think it's starting to look at uh, pharmacogenomics or things that can uh, maybe modify uh, treatment or trying to identify subgroups of people that uh, I, are a high risk that we can use, for example, for uh, protective uh, treatments, th things like that, that you know, will have a higher impact on the, on the patients right now uh it also gets me really excited so i think those two things are probably uh you know my, the main the main drivers for me coming to the lab every day thank you um okay i don't think we have any more questions um so that i'd like to thank you very much dr uh Matson, for joining us today um, and thank you everyone who joined us um this recording will be made live so you can go back and watch it again later so um yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Mata, and um, thank, thank you very much. Have a great day. Okay.